Have you been for a medical checkup before? During a checkup, one of the steps is to collect samples of your blood and your urine. Then, the lab technologies will carry out a number of tests to identify a variety of chemicals in your body. Now, in BioWorld today, I'm going to introduce you to two very simple analytical techniques. They include the process of chromatography, specifically paper chromatography, as well as the process of electrophoresis. These pictures show us three different types of chromatography, paper, liquid, and gas chromatography. Chromatography is a technique where we are able to separate a mixture. For example, here in paper chromatography, we are trying to separate the mixture that makes this black dot. And you can see in that black dot, there is actually a mixture of green, blue, and maybe purple. Likewise here in liquid chromatography, we are trying to separate the different types of liquids. And in gas chromatography, we are separating different types of gases. To carry out chromatography, we need to use two phases, the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So in the case of paper chromatography, the mobile phase is the liquid that is in the bottom of this container. And the stationary phase is the paper that you see hanging here. Just for knowledge, the liquid chromatography uses liquid as the mobile phase and solid beads. That's the white color thing in this column. Okay, these solid beads are the stationary phase. In gas chromatography, the mobile phase will be the gas and the stationary phase will be beads. But let's just focus on paper chromatography as required by our syllabus. We can use paper chromatography to separate the pigments of chlorophyll in a leaf. To do that, we need samples of leaf, a mortar and pestle, as well as acetone as the solvent. What we need to do is place the leaf into the mortar, add a little bit of acetone and start pounding with the pestle until we get a fine pulp like this. We pound using the mortar and pestle to break the cell wall of the leaves as well as the organelle chloroplast. This is so that chlorophyll can be released. The acetone will help to dissolve the pigments in chlorophyll. After that, we need to filter this pulp so as to get a thick concentrate of chlorophyll. In step two, we have to transfer the concentrated mixture of chlorophyll onto the absorptive paper, which is the stationary phase. We need to make a very fine spot of chlorophyll on this paper. To do that, we can use the head of a pin, where we touch the head of the pin into this mixture and transfer the pigment onto the absorptive paper. This step has to be repeated 15 to 20 times so that we get a very concentrated mixture of chlorophyll. After that, we can start to set up the rest of the experiment. This includes preparation of a boiling tube containing the solvent mainly made up of petroleum ether. This solvent will function as the mobile phase for the chromatography experiment. Then we can transfer the absorptive paper into this boiling tube. We must make sure the spot is slightly above the level of the solvent. Next, we just observe 
the magic happening. The solvent will diffuse up the chromatography paper by capillary action. And as it moves up, you can see the chlorophyll separating. This is because the chlorophyll will dissolve in the solvent and be pulled along by the solvent. Once the solvent reaches the top of the chromatography paper, we can stop the experiment and we have to mark the final line as the solvent front. We can remove the chromatography paper from the boiling tube and start measuring some values to calculate. We need to find the value of the solvent front, that is the distance moved by the solvent. To do that, we have to measure from the middle of the spot to the final line. Then the second data will be related to the pigments. So here, if we have four pigments, then we need four other data. For example, if I want to know the distance moved by my yellow pigment, I shall have to measure from the middle of the spot to the middle of the pigment. Using the distance moved by the solvent and the distance moved by the pigment, I can calculate the value of RF, which stands for retention factor. The formula for RF is distance moved by the pigment divided by the distance moved by the solvent. So we take this chromatography paper as an example. Of course, here the experiment is carried out differently where instead of using a spot, the student has used a line. Regardless, the chlorophyll has been separated. And if we measure the distances, the theory values will be as shown here. In practical, students rarely get these values, but you will get values around this range. However, you will surely get the colors, that is the color green, blue-green, yellow, and yellow-orange will be visible. Gray is a bit more difficult to view. Now, based on the RF values, as well as the color of the pigment, we can identify the types of chlorophyll. All this while, you thought chlorophyll was just green. Now you see chlorophyll is made up of chlorophyll B, which is green, chlorophyll A, which is blue-green, xanthophyll, which is yellow, pheophytin, which is grey, and carotene, which is yellow-orange. So, if not for chromatography, we would continue believing that chlorophyll is just green colour. The pigments in chlorophyll were able to be separated using chromatography because of three principles. Firstly, the solubility of chlorophyll in the solvent that was used, acetone as well as petroleum ether. The size of the individual pigments in chlorophyll, as well as the stickiness of the pigments onto the adsorptive paper. This stickiness is called adsorption. Okay, or you can use the word ad. So using these three principles, let's make some conclusions about the pigments that have been separated. Now carotenoids here are the ones that have moved the furthest. So from its position, we can make three conclusions. The first conclusion is based on its solubility. It was able to move so far because it is the most soluble pigment. It was also able to move far because it has to be the smallest pigment. That's why it was so light and easy to move. And the third point is that it was not so sticky onto the adsorptive paper. 
So instead of sticking on the paper, it kept moving with the solvent. Likewise, if we want to make conclusion about chlorophyll B, which is closest to the spot, we can say that it was less soluble. So that's why it didn't move with the solvent. Or it was too large and heavy, so it was unable to move far. Or the fact that it was very sticky. Okay, that's high adsorption. So that is why it stuck to the paper and the solvent was unable to move it. Next, we look at electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is another method of separating molecules but it is specific to molecules that can be positively or negatively charged. So that is why it uses an electrical field to separate these molecules. There is paper electrophoresis and gel electrophoresis. Now in paper electrophoresis, you can see there's a piece of paper here. It is more suitable for small molecules such as amino acids. So electrophoresis can involve basic as well as acidic amino acids. You cannot separate polar and non-polar amino acids here because they are not charged. Gel electrophoresis, on the other hand, are suitable for larger molecules. These include charged proteins as well as charged nucleic acids. Let's first start with paper electrophoresis. For paper electrophoresis, we need two petri dish containing electrolytes with a specific pH, so it will function as a buffer. Then we need the electrical source, which is connected to the buffer solution through two electrodes, a cathode electrode and an anode electrode. Finally, we need paper since this is paper electrophoresis. The paper has to be folded so that one end of the paper is immersed into the electrolyte at the cathode end and the other end of the paper is immersed in the electrolyte that has the anode end. Next, we need to put in the sample. Spotting is similar to the spotting in chromatography. Only here, the spotting has to be done in the center of the paper. So now we have the spot, which is a mixture of amino acids. We have to switch on the electric supply, and this will then enable the mixture of amino acid to become separated. To view the separation of the amino acids, let me magnify the filter paper. You can see this is the cathode end and this is the anode end, but you can't see any separation. This is to be expected since amino acids are colorless. So to help visualize the presence of the amino acids, we need a reagent for amino acids called ninhydrin. When you spray ninhydrin onto the filter paper, the amino acids become visible. The position of the separated amino acids can help us make a few conclusions. For example, this amino acid has to be positively charged because only then can it be attracted to the negative cathode. And from our previous knowledge, we know that basic amino acids, when placed in an aqueous solution, can become positively charged. Besides that, the buffer that was used in the electrophoresis could also cause the ionic change in the amino acid. We've learned about the role of buffer in relation to isoelectric point in part 3 of our protein videos, which you can review to refresh. But in this example, since the buffer was pH 5, and let's take for example that this amino acid's pi was 7. So since the pH 
is less than the PI, therefore the amino acid became positively charged. Let's see if you can make similar conclusions about the amino acid that moved to the anode end. This amino acid will definitely have to be negatively charged to be attracted to the anode. And this can only happen to acidic amino acids. And the PI has to be lower than the pH. Okay, so for example, here the PI of this amino acid is say 3. The buffer was pH 5. So this makes the amino acid negative. So enough with paper electrophoresis. Let's move on to gel electrophoresis. The apparatus in gel electrophoresis is similar to paper electrophoresis. There is a power supply. There are anode and cathode electrodes. There is buffer solution with specific pH. But the difference is instead of paper being used, gel is used. And this gel could be either a chemical called SDS, sodium diodesyl sulfate, or PAGE, which is short for polyacrylamide gel. And you can see that on the surface of the gel, there are some pockets cut out, which we call as the welds. For gel electrophoresis, we can use samples of both DNA and protein, but there are some rules. For example, if we are separating DNA, you find DNA can only be negatively charged. So, the wells must be positioned next to the cathode electrode so that the negative DNA can be attracted to the positive anode and become separated. However, if we are using protein samples, proteins can become either negative or positive depending on the pH of the buffer used. So, in the cases of protein separation, the wells can be positioned next to the cathode electron or the wells can be positioned next to the anode electron. Once this setup is ready, inserting of samples requires a special gadget called the micropipette, which will very carefully insert the specimens into the well. Then the electrical supply will be switched on and observation has to be carried out using special reagents. Just like in paper electrophoresis, we needed to use a reagent called ninhydrin. So in gel electrophoresis, if we are separating proteins, we will have to use reagents such as a silver stain or the Kumasi Brilliant Blue Dye. Or if we are separating DNAs, then we will have to use ethidium bromide or fluorescence under UV light. So what we see over here could be fluorescence under UV light. Okay, You can see that from the negative end, the DNA fragments are moving towards the positive end. Electrophoresis separates proteins, amino acids, as well as DNA based on two principles. Firstly, that molecules have specific PI. This is in reference to proteins and amino acids. And that molecules that are charged, this is inclusive of DNA, can be separated in an electric field. So, if we manipulate the pH of the buffer, we are able to make molecules become charged. If the pH of the buffer is above pi, the amino acids and proteins can become negatively charged. DNA is also negatively charged. So in an electric field, they move to the anode end. 
Now, when the buffer has a pH below the pi, then the molecules become positively charged and move towards the cathode end. So, if we look at the fragments of DNA here, the conclusion we can make about the DNA fragments that are closer to the negative end is that they are less negatively charged and size still matters whereby the molecules maybe are large, therefore they are unable to move far. In contrast, the fragments at the end here are definitely smaller so they can move further and they must have more negative charges causing them to be more attracted to the positive end. So the two analytical techniques I just discussed and many other analytical techniques are carried out in biochemistry labs like this. So if you are interested in research and development in the future, this will be your office. That's all from me. Bye-bye.